Good evening and welcome to all the participants to this 55th leadership conversation hosted by ICFI Online. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest from UK, Mr. Richard McCracken. He is the director for the Case Center UK. And I'm extremely happy, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Richard to this conversation. Good afternoon and welcome, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Amazing. It's my good fortune that I'm sharing the screen with you, Richard. Uh, your contribution to the case method for the last 14 years has been immense. And uh, we've been working very closely, especially Ikfai Business School Hyderabad. And uh, some of our star professors and case others have been dealing with you directly over the last several years. And we have very good memories and we have won several awards. And you had also visited us at Ikfai Business School Hyderabad recently. So thank you very much for joining. I value your time and your expertise for this conversation. I will do a brief introduction, Richard, with your permission and then hand it over back to you for your presentation. Yes, so this is the 50, 55th conversation in our series. Mr. Richard is going to talk about case studies, uh, business practice, research and learning. First half an hour is about the introduction and presentation by Mr. Richard McCracken, and the second half an hour is a Q&A session, which is moderated by Professor Prasad and myself. Always cheerful, uh, Mr. Richard McCracken is serving as the director of the Case Center since March 2008, and he oversees the Case Center's global operations from its UK office. Uh, the Case Center is actually housed in the Cranfield University in the UK. His responsibilities include uh, uh, regular representation of the case community at conferences, workshops, and competitions as both a speaker and a moderator. Mr. Richard chairs the judging panels for the case center's annual case method awards and competitions. He also regularly judges other competitions, including EFMD's case writing competitions and the SEEBS annual competition for cases with a focus on China. These are prestigious global competitions. He is managing editor of Case Focus, which is a peer reviewed journal of business and management teaching cases for the Middle East and Africa. Prior to joining the Case Center, Mr. Richard was head of intellectual property at the Open University. During his time at the Open University, Mr. Richard was instrumental in the development and launch of the Open Learn Initiative, which makes educational resources from the Open University courses freely available worldwide through the internet. Mr. Richard was also a member of the senior management team responsible for negotiating and managing the university's unique relationship with the BBC. He has long experience of working to improve the relationship between higher education and the media industries in the UK excuse me, and served on several UK national committees developing guidelines on managing intellectual property. Mr. Richard holds degrees in English literature from uh, the English literature is from University of Sheffield and uh, the degree in law is from Open University. And, uh, and he also holds a postgraduate diploma in intellectual property law from University of London. Nice, exciting, amazing, rich profile, uh, Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Richard. I will also, in the same breath, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Professor R. Prasad, and then I'll hand it over back to you very quickly. Professor R. Prasad uh, is uh, uh, the Director for Academic Wing at the ICFI Group. Uh, um, his uh, areas of focus are strategy and entrepreneurship, and he has corporate experience and entrepreneurial experience, everything put together over the last three decades. Uh, he is a PGDM from IIM Kolkata and uh, is BTEC from IIT Mumbai. He published uh, several articles, books, and conference papers. Welcome, Professor Aprasa. Now, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. So, uh, Mr. Richard, uh, on behalf of everyone at the ICFI Group and ICFI Business School, a lot of our colleagues from the Case Research Center have also joined and they're eager to listen to you. And similarly, the entire management community in India and abroad uh, have joined to understand some of the things in this conversation. Probably you know some of them, uh, but most of them know you. 
So over to you, Mr. Richard, and I request you to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadaka. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be joining you, um, especially as I, I, I understand that uh, there are quite a few business practitioners joining the, the uh, session today. Um, that's a group of people I don't have so much opportunity to speak to in a, in a, a framework like this. So I'm looking forward to, to that. And I've, I've pitched my conversation um, at them. Um, so let me begin by looking uh, to share my screen. So uh, what I want to uh, talk about today, and I, I'm going to have a fairly relaxed and conversational um, approach to this, uh, because I think uh, this is really just to stimulate the conversation at the end of the session, and I'm looking forward to that enormously. I want to talk about case studies. Now, the case studies that I um, am uh, imagining are for teaching in the classroom. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with teaching case studies, um, as part of a, uh, the, the case method approach to education, um, case studies are really uh, an academic description and capture of a real life situation, a scenario with a protagonist facing a dilemma and making a critical business decision or set of decisions. Um, in the context of the company, the industry, and the wider comp competitive environment in which they find themselves. The case studies um, structure the information in the story and allow a teacher to take uh, the scenario into the classroom where students are taught not by being told things, but by being questioned. So the, the students uh, discuss the scenario and imagine themselves into the position of the protagonist and explore the possibilities that are there, the constraints, uh, the impact of competition, <clears throat> the resources that are available, timescales and so on. And they come up with a solution uh, to, the, to the dilemma. Not, um, not a, a solution which is uh, tied down and, and one stop only, but a solution which proposes ways forward um, in, in progressing the company and improving the situation in which it finds itself. So that context we feel is a really rich and rewarding one for students. And it doesn't just impart information it, uh, or a better understanding of theory that they may have been taught in class. It also develops skills that are really uh, uh, business driven essential in their future career and which improve both their employability at the point of leaving the MBA uh, or the business school, um, um, but also stay with them throughout their business careers. It affects and alters the way in which they look at and analyze and uh, adapt and um, react to problems. So what I want to look at today is those case, uh, case studies how they are written and how they tie in to bring benefit, not just in the classroom to the students, but benefit throughout the, the, a, a, a crucial triumvirate of interest between business and business practitioners, academia, that's uh, academics themselves in writing up research and conducting research and teaching, and the students in the, in the way in which uh, case studies can impact on their on their learning um, and that's where my title comes from business practice research and learning so what the case studies do is to explore and outline and establish and strengthen vital connections between research and teaching academia with business practice to the benefit of each and in this session, I want to uh, put a particular emphasis on business. But in order to do that, I think it's good for you to understand uh, the background in which uh, in, in which this um, benefit is delivered. Um, I want to start with this quote from Kil, uh, Kilduff, citing, uh, which is cited in Van Maan, Sorensen and Mitchell. Good theory comes from engagement with the problems of the world, not gaps in the literature. So uh, sometimes for academics, uh, those who write cases and research cases 
um, find that their work is less well regarded than pure research activity which is published in the form of academic journal articles. My contention is that actually uh, writing a case is an alternative or an additional form of output from an original research project, not something which is a uh, lesser quality. Um, and in fact, looking if, if we take this um, quotation into account, it's actually more engaged with uh, developing uh, worthwhile theory and tested theory than by exploring the literature. So the elements of a teaching case and writing a teaching case are these. First of all, uh, the case author needs access to a body of practice, a situation, a scenario which comes from real business life and which, uh, which features an engaging protagonist who is uh, struggling with a dilemma or a problem. Then the academic needs to do proper research in order to explore the scenario properly. They need to bring an understanding of theory and that theory itself may be tested in face of what's actually happening. So quite often case writers find that they bring a theory, but in looking in detail at the scenario on the ground and how business practitioners actually deal with this, the theory is placed under, under test. Sometimes it passes that test and sometimes it should be adapted as a result of the test. There's then a process of case writing in which the academic writes up the research, often in partnership uh, with another academic or with pr a professional publishing editorial team, which helps them turn the research into a case. But the case is not the end of the story. The case is only a structure, a convenient structure, which allows the teacher to take the scenario into the classroom. And case teaching lies at the heart of the case method. Here, as I said earlier, uh, students are asked questions and, and, and the teacher becomes a kind of facilitator or a guide, walking them through the scenario, asking questions and stimulating the students to come to their own conclusions. And in that, they start to develop skills of analysis, collaborative working, um, speaking in front of a, a, another group and holding their position in the face of challenge because there's a lot of challenge in the case classroom as well. All of these skills are extremely useful in developing uh, their readiness for a long-term and productive career. And the final element which I want to mention because it comes into increasing the impact of this circle that I've described is distribution. So it's possible for the teacher to have written their own case and then taught it in their own classroom. But what then? By distributing the case through an organisation such as ourselves, what that does is it takes the case and, and makes it impactful in other schools' classrooms, in other teachers' classrooms. And so it multiplies the impact on students around the world and the benefit that it brings to all the elements in uh, in this kind of biosphere of uh, case writing that I'll explore in a moment. This is the case study life cycle. So some research is conducted. That benefits uh, both the company and the individual who are being researched, if you like, who have very generously um, agreed to, be collab to collaborate with the case writer in the research to explore the scenario. Uh, cases are then written up and as I've said, I see those as an alternative or an other research um, output rather than a replacement or a poor cousin of a research output. Classroom impact comes from teaching in the classroom. As I mentioned, the distribution widens that impact and that also um, brings a deeper kind of relationship with the original company so that quite often a case writer will go back and revisit the company to, uh, to perhaps drill more deeply into other scenarios or into the same situation to see how the company has moved it on. And that develops more trust between those people within the company who are collaborating with them and the, and the case writer themselves to the benefit of both.
So let's look at the players. Who actually contributes to this uh, cycle? Well, from business, um, it's essential. Nothing can happen without some kind of collaboration with business if one is talking about a case based on field research. It's certainly possible to, to, to write many high quality cases on desk research or existing other sources. But um, in, in this scenario that I'm looking at now, I'm, I'm assuming that the case is based on field research and every field researcher needs a contact, a, a, a good friend, um, someone who's willing to collaborate and, uh, and work together um, within the business who can talk through the scenario with the benefit of real experience and get behind the scenes. So that's essential. And that's a very difficult first step in a lot of cases. Many case authors uh, have found an interesting scenario, but then have difficulty in, in uh, persuading the company to collaborate. Part of what I'm talking about today is to persuade those of you who are in business that actually collaborating with uh, an academic in researching and writing a case is of value both to the business as well as to the academic and to the academic students. We need an academic author then in order to write the case. We need students in the classroom and students benefit as well. So we'll talk about what students get from, from this process. And then the author school benefits, I'll talk about that. And if the, if the case is distributed outside the school, then other business schools in other continents benefit. So do the alumni. Sometimes the case is written about a, a company in which alumni are working and they are the conduit in which along which the access to the company is provided and they provide insight and tell share stories but also um, the alumni carry um, a, a stronger connection if they can look at cases um, and take them with them into their working life so it can also benefit both the alum and the school itself by being a, a means or a connection in which they remain in contact and then business also benefits, um, as we'll see as we go along. So what are the objectives for the case authors in writing a case? I think it's useful as a business person, if someone approaches you and says, um, I'd like to collaborate with you in, in understanding this scenario. I've heard about it at a conference. I've read about it in the press. I've heard about it on the radio or on television. And I'd like to explore this scenario more. What's their motivation for doing that? Well, overwhelmingly, it's to achieve learning outcomes in their classroom. Most cases are written with that in mind because the author wants to teach the case and benefit their students. The context of that is their own course or module and their own students. Um, but. As well as that, I think that one of the most powerful thing that comes from case authors approaching companies that they are in close contact with and understand is that they are writing about local companies. It may be a small one person startup. It may be a, a, a chain of coffee houses or, or other fast food outlets that are local to their area and not well known outside. Um, or it may be uh, something that an alumnum has developed and they have a link there. All of those are very interesting, both in their own classroom and to other schools outside of, of uh, the region. So our support and our advice is quite often Write local because you really understand the business uh, culture, the business thinking from the inside, but think global impact. And uh, we have a number of cases. The quality of cases being written in India is um, excellent. They win uh, competitions. They are, um, they are adopted at business schools around the world time and time again. And, and many of those cases are written about Indian companies or regional Indian companies, but they're written with real understanding and with a high quality output, and they have a global reach. 
And remember, it's not just a global reach for the case author and their case, that also takes the brand of the company into business schools around the world. For students, they benefit by experiencing a simulation, if you like, of real life business decisions being discussed and addressed in class. That increases their engagement with their learning and it develops those skills that I've outlined earlier on, which improves their employability. And those cases stay with them. It's a common um, experience for many professors to have students return many years later in the most senior positions in, in multinational companies and say, Prof, I still remember that case that you taught me and I use it nearly every day or every week in my career when I'm faced with a dilemma. It's really stuck with me. Um, so cases are for life, not just for a one-off classroom experience. The business school benefits by having students who are better engaged with their learning, but they also, if they've written lots of cases, discover that um, the accreditation agencies such as AACSB, or uh, as I understand it, the Indian government, um, they also accept the, the distribution of cases and the uptake of cases outside of the school as evidence of quality in the school that's applying for accreditation. As the cases travel and are distributed into other classrooms around the globe, it brings wider recognition and branding opportunities for the originating school and for the author. Many authors get inv invitations to speak at conferences or to visit other schools, um, and the school itself uh, has its reputation enhanced by its branding being carried into other people's classrooms. It also strengthens links with business between the school and the local business community about whom the cases have been written. And that benefits both, but for the school's point of view, you may be able to arrange, um, have contacts that allow you to, or help you to arrange internships. Uh, you may find some sponsorship of uh, opportunities as well. And also in the classroom, many case writers and case teachers invite the protagonist of their case to come into the classroom and take part in the, case, in the case being taught. And that really enhances the engagement that students have with the learning. If they have an opportunity to question the protagonist and experience what they experienced in, in facing the problem in real life and how they chose to um, uh, address the, the um, challenge and what the result was. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, it strengthens that bond between the school and alumni. Some of this depends on distribution. As I've said, it, dis it supports accreditation and can be used as evidence of quality. It enhances the author, the school and the, comp and the company brands, and it takes local cases into global cl classrooms. And that also, let's say in an Indian case, an Indian case being taught in an American classroom often gives confidence to Indian students in that American classroom because they are given an enhanced status in the discussion as experts on the Indian brand. And that encourages them, it gives them confidence, and it allows them to speak up in a classroom that can to be, begin with often seem quite intimidating to someone who's coming to that environment for the first time. So distribution can support many, uh, many uh, benefits. Now let's come with that, having set that scenario, what's in it for you business people uh, when a case author approaches you and asks if you are willing to, for them to come and research a problem and a dilemma that you've been facing? Well, one of the benefits is that you get you get the benefit of a relationship with a, a highly skilled academic who can give insight into your existing practice. That's not to be uh, that's not to be taken lightly. That is a real benefit for you. It gives you a strong connection to the school over time. And again, having the opportunity of having that academic connection over time allows the impact of that academic insight to strengthen and improve your, um, your own business practice. It's almost like having a mentor or a tutor 
uh, available, someone that you can talk to and have and, and develop insight with current practice elsewhere in your same in the same industry. So it broadens your experience, if you like. It allows you to connect with other business in the region and nationally, because often those case writers have existing connections because they've written cases with other businesses. It can help you identify talent and help with your recruitment. Now, how can it do that? Well, if you accept the invitation to come and talk to students and take part in the case being taught in the classroom, then you have an opportunity to identify talent in that classroom and you can offer internships or you can start to talk to people um, and network with students as well as with academics. Um, and sometimes companies use a case as a part of the recruitment process where they ask students to work through a case and come up with some solution to a problem that's in it. Beyond recruitment, many companies also use a case written about themselves as part of the induction process. It's a way of explaining their company culture to new recruits, so it can help with your in induction. The distribution of the case outside the original business school to business schools elsewhere raises your brand profile. It takes your company name into other classrooms. Now, that doesn't sound terribly exciting if you're talking about a conventional university. But here we're talking about business schools and the students in business schools are going to become business people. And so, in effect, it's raising your brand profile with other business people in other countries. And that can be extremely useful. I'd say also that one of the most useful and beneficial um, things to come out of the relationship with a case teacher is to take the case when it's complete. It's about your company. Take it into the company and have it taught to your management team or your board. And that will help you reflect on, the, on, on your behaviour. Did we, did we really take the best decision there? Were there alternatives that we missed? How could we improve our processes? How could we improve our relationships between the management teams and those responsible for the action? And how can we improve ourselves as a business? Using a case that's written about us, well, that's a, that's a once in a, a lifetime opportunity, isn't it? That you, you have that kind of degree of insight into something about yourself and can, and can take advantage of it. And then the process, as I mentioned a few slides ago, can repeat itself because having established the relationship with the academic author and begin to trust them a bit more and you get to know each other, then there's an opportunity to say, well, if you have enjoyed exploring that scenario, there's this, the, once we had, once we'd addressed that, then we were faced with this. Could you write a case about this? Or could you revisit the original scenario and write another case about it? So the process repeats. And each time it repeats, the ties get stronger and the benefits get more impactful. And so to conclude, I'd say that um, what I've done is try to give a broad brush overview of the benefits, the way in which writing a case can benefit all of the players. It depends on their level of engagement and their Enthu the enthusiasm with which they adopt the opportunities that are given by the process. But the benefits are real uh, for business, students, teachers, case writers and business schools. Um, I hope that that encourages you the next time you are approached by a case writer to say, yes, I would like to know more about it. Um, and well, that's, I look forward to discussing it with you now. And let's open the floor and have a conversation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Richard, for that engaging uh, uh, overview of uh, how cases have begun, with what objectives and what kind of benefits it entails for various participants like business schools, teachers, students, business practitioners and businesses, and in general, the management community around. I think. Uh, it is, it is like ABCs of cases uh, that you have uh, taken us through. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, for want of time, I would like to just summarize that uh, 
<clears throat> very briefly that uh, cases are real life for scenarios or situations captured in an academic format where there is a protagonist who is faced with dilemmas and students are supposed to go over that and probably learn and face those challenges and come up with solutions that are going to be useful uh, for them. The way forward mechanism uh, in terms of grappling with similar situations in real life. Uh, cases are supposed to be written local and, uh, and, and that helps us think globally. The reach is global. Local businesses have the benefit of uh, taking it wider for the wider impact as well as visibility and branding. Cases are for life, especially some of the students, most of us who have read cases, we remember the names of the cases as well. And very often when we come across and face those tough situations, we, we at least talk about uh, some critical incidents in the case and refer to what we studied in our business school long, long back. So cases are for life. And uh, in, in, in summary, uh, you have presented, uh, Richard, uh, the virtuous circle for all the stakeholders, uh, uh, the benefits of writing cases, teaching cases, and studying cases. But that's an amazing uh, contribution. Uh, over the last 14 years, uh, Richard, uh, you've been making some of the brightest students and uh, practitioners and business schools to put their head down and start writing or reading the cases. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, uh, I will once again welcome uh, the academic leaders and business practitioners who have joined uh, from India and abroad. Uh, thank you very much for joining. The Q&A session will begin very soon. I also welcome uh, Professor G. Murlidara, who is known to uh, Richard very well. He heads the ICFI Business School Bangalore right now. And uh, we have Professor Mahinder Reddy, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of ICFI Foundation for Higher Education. Uh, and I welcome all other business leaders, uh, case authors uh, who are present in big numbers uh, to, to stay tuned to listen to uh, Richard and his conversation and his responses in the Q&A session. Uh, quickly, I request uh, Professor Rao Prasad to start the Q&A session. Now, over to you, Professor Prasad. Thank you, Professor Rao. I think uh, we have heard a very enlightening session. We had a very enlightening session on what cases are for and how it's going to benefit various stakeholders. I think the first question in the series, as we usually have, is about uh, Mr. McCacken himself. You put in a lot of time uh, at the case center. You have had a huge exposure before that. So in your journey at the case center, and if you take the case as a tool, you would have seen an evolution. And you would have seen some forces which are shaping how this journey is going. Could you throw some insights on that? Certainly. Um... Uh, my journey began with, uh, I was fairly inexperienced with case studies when I arrived. I, my, my legal background um, had given me experience of case law in studying the law, but um, I was a bit mystified about how the case method could work. So the first time I sat in a classroom where a case was being taught was a real light bulb moment. It really opened my eyes to the power of the case method. And and since then, um, I've been really pleased to see the development of uh, several themes um, uh, and, and new expressions. One is a move away from the traditional formats. When I first joined 14 years ago, there was quite, um, quite a strong agreement about what constituted a good case and the format it should take and the way it should be structured. Um, that was based very strongly on the Harvard Business School model as it was originally developed about 100 years ago. Well, actually 100 years ago this year. Um, but I've seen the growth of um, alternative ways of writing and structuring the case, all with the same uh, goal in mind, which is to um, to stimulate the class discussion. But there's been a development of much shorter cases, so the average length of a case has come down, and I would say that probably the average length is somewhere around 10 to 12 pages at the moment, but many people say that they are aiming for between five and eight pages. And there is a strong undercurrent of authors who are writing compact cases uh, of less than five pages. 
Um, that's um, combined with alternative formats, uh, an increasing use of multimedia, not pure multimedia, but additional media elements to support the case, the use of video clips, interviews with uh, CEOs, um, uh, videos that show the in interior of factories or shop floors, um, uh, still images, um, images of uh, logos and branding and so on, uh, images of the product being used. Um, these are all growing in um, popularity and also formats such as um, cartoon cases or, or, or graphic novel cases which look much more like a Superman comic than, than a traditional academic paper. And uh, one of your own, the uh, much missed Deba Pratim Purkayasta, a great genius of a case writer, was one of the leaders and the first adopters of the uh, cartoon or, or graphic strip um, case format. And, and that proved uh, enormously successful. Um, and now with the pandemic, um, a speed up of cases that have been written with, uh, with an online environment in mind, uh, they are um, chunked differently. So um, students tend to, um, as we all do, get very tired reading long stretches of text online. Um, so the case is often um, structured to be in shorter segments um, with gaps in between to allow time for breakout groups or other kinds of exercise, self-reflective tests, um, some assessments. Um, and that comes uh, to make almost like an online, bo born online version of, of the case. So, I, and I see that continuing. I think as we get as we get more familiar with online and other technical uh, formats, we'll become less obsessed with the technology and, and doing things because the technology allows us to. And we need to refocus on what it is, what is our purpose? What's the learning and the educational purpose behind uh, teaching online or, or an online classroom? And how can we best deliver those learning objectives? And that will drive the next evolution of the cases rather than the technology itself. Thank you. I think the first, uh, uh, what I would call inspiration is that you've started without a background of a case. There are some questions related to that. People who don't have a background and then you are virtually, you know, shaping the way it needs to go ahead. So I think a lot of people in the audience will feel very encouraged about that. That was one point. And the second point is that uh, you have uh, covered the dimensions. You mentioned the format and the differences in the format. You looked at the page size and you also started talking about the time dimension and how uh, the case is going to be now not just on pages, but also on time and uh, how well to do it. So those very, very insightful points. Uh, the next question that I'm uh, coming in is with an Indian context. Uh, India has the largest uh, management education system in the world. And uh, there are a lot of uh, students of, uh, who have different needs, expectations. Access is a huge goal. We are at 27%. percent we are trying to go to 50%. And that's also going to impact uh, management education. Um, affordability is also an issue, particularly for uh, you know, the more than 75% of the students in this segment. So how do we ensure that we are able to make these uh, uh, these cases, how do we use these cases effectively, give access to it? How, how can this happen for the mass of India? That's a very good question. I think, I think there are several um, factors that, that at play here. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, online access figures for India, but it may be that either online access is a, is a barrier um, because not everyone is able to access um, online in which case um, paper cases are really effective. Uh, it, the, the case, it's not the case itself, it's the case discussion that's, that really brings home the, the learning. The case, um, let's, say I, let's say I make a really nourishing stew um, um, and, and it's going to feed my family. If I serve that on a plate, it, it doesn't work because it, 
it's too it's too liquid. The plate isn't designed to hold the 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 the, the soup. Um, I need a bowl. So so what the case is is a is a bowl that holds the content of the story. But bowls come in many shapes. So so the case bowl may be um, on paper, it may be online, it may be uh, multimedia. It's the content that's important. And the nourishment that comes from the case is, is really delivered in the case discussion in the classroom. Now, the classroom may be face to face, it may be indoors or outdoors, it may be online. So the question for accessibility is, which is more accessible to most people? Um, that I don't understand, but you will. If, if most people have um, easy access and affordable access online, then the case method works very well online. If, on the other hand, you need to reach people who don't have good connectivity, then paper-based cases um, work very well. And the other thing I'd add is that, that paper-based cases can carry a cost. So in order to improve access there, many case collections are free. So there is no charge for accessing them. And we, we, do, we distribute those free case collections as well as the paid for collections. Um, and, and our paid for collections, we have a preferential rate um, which our members in India can take advantage of. So, so that's how we're trying to address that as well. Thank you. I think uh, you have opened some doors about how uh, a lot of uh, students and a lot of schools who may not be uh, able to pay for this have ways by which they can still access the case and then use the discussion very productively. I think yeah. uh, there is some insight in this, uh, some direction by which institutions can use. The third uh, question that we have is, you now we've got uh, uh, AR, VR, XR, Metaverse, and you're talking about uh, twins of the real world in the digital yeah. world, and then being able to do go there and uh, you know, simulate in real time, and then integrate both these, you know, add on, integrate. There's so many uh, possibilities which are being discussed today. So, how do you see the case evolving in such a situation? Um, yes, it's already starting to evolve in that situation. A, a number of years ago, perhaps ten years ago. We had a winning case, which looked at a, an on, it worked in an online environment, and actually the authors wrote the case in order for students in Australia, Singapore, and Switzerland to work together. So the authors were from the from schools in those three countries, and their students worked together in exploring the online environment. It was a kind of social role playing game. And so, so there you had students from three really vastly different continents um, working together through a case. That was 10 years ago. Um, now, um, some schools like um, IE in uh, Spain and Naoma in France are developing cases using AR and um, VR. And there the students walk through um, I think one case that I saw was set in a commercial chain store and uh, it set the students a challenge of um, how would you lay the store out to maximise traffic through the store and um, sales through the store. Students could walk through the existing store and explore it from as though they were actually visiting the store. So um, lots of exciting possibilities. It's It has challenges in terms of um, affordability because it's very expensive still the technology um, but also challenging to um, academics who are used to working alone uh, in, a, in writing their they write papers alone they write uh, case studies alone and much of their uh, much of their research is conducted alone or with other academic colleagues VR and AR cases really depend on working as part of a team of craft professionals who understand educational design or sound recording or video recording and software. 
So that's a challenge. That's a challenge for academics. Um, what is their role in a? I, I think I think they have a leadership role in a team like that to uh, to lead the academic value and direction of the product and to ensure that the case really delivers the learning objectives. But within that, they may have to defer to some others on the the structure of the case or how to best achieve the uh, visual effects and so on. Absolutely. I think uh, this is very encouraging. You have mentioned that this journey has already begun and you've identified the challenges and you pointed out that perhaps one of the most important challenges is a cultural challenge. I think uh, that is going to set the pace on how it's done. And uh, I think this is something which is already happening in the online education world where we have to work with instructional designers, technology teams to ensure that finally what we do, the learning outcomes come not necessarily the way we think it should from an academic point, but from a student centric point of view, where I think uh, uh, many of these other team players have a lot to con contribute. Yeah. And it's Thank it's you. often not a pleasant experience. It's it's not that um, it's not that it should everyone has to, it will be in agreement. There will be many uh, very deep felt differences of opinion and arguments. Uh, I've been on uh, production teams that that are creating distance learning materials, and many of the disagreements are very angry, but constructive. So, so it, it, it definitely is challenging. Absolutely. And I think the challenge of pulling in different directions will, will lead to something which comes out to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And the last question in this cluster is about uh, AI and machine learning. And uh, what kind of influence will they have on researcher activities? Um, how do researchers stand to gain from this? So there are questions like this, which are playing on uh, case writers minds. Would you have any thoughts on this? Um, I, I don't understand AI, um, so I have to say that it will have an impact. I, I think I think many people will use AI in their research. Um, my my thought is I would like people to write some cases that question AI and the societal impact of AI and big data. Um, uh, I, I see. I see two types of cases. I see lots of cases that are enthusiastic about new technology and the opportunity it gives to entrepreneurs, for example, especially in the context of uh, disruptive entrepreneurship. And I see many, um, I see many cases that are very enthusiastic about new finance models like um, like Bitcoin and other non fungible um, tokens and blockchain. I would like to see some cases exploring the impact of disruptive technological entrepreneurship and whether the disruption comes from the technology or from exploiting workers and and their pay and conditions. And I'd like to see uh, cases about the impact of AI and <clears throat> the use of um, the use of data controlled by uh, social media companies and the impact on their users and society generally. Um, and I'd like to see some cases that questioned the, the validity of uh, initiatives like Bitcoin and blockchain. Are they really what, they're, what their proponents say they will do? Will, it, will they really be able to l deliver that? Um, but as for as for researchers using AI tools themselves in their research, I'm sure that will come. I'm sure that will be um, really beneficial. But but be careful. Thank you for raising the concern. I think uh, you know you have uh, you've seen a lot of cases being written on the positive side of it, whether it's for disruptive entrepreneurship or in the area of finance. And you you are uh, highlighting the point that there need to be more questions raised on the other side of the table as to how it is going to be beneficial for society so that frameworks can be put in place and necessary questions can be exercised. Thank you very much. I hand this e back to Professor each year, each year, as part of our case writing competitions, we, we have a hot topic which calls for cases on a specific topic. And this, the, the, this year's competition, which has just opened, is calling for cases that are looking at the impact of uh, AI 
and social media and so on on society. So there's, there's an opportunity there for anyone who would like to write a case and submit it. Thank you for the information. I think I hope it benefits a lot of our audience. Back to Professor Rao. Thank you. Uh, Richard, it's been a wonderful conversation so far. Uh, I'm enjoying and I think uh, it is much, much deeper as we are talking about several issues that are affecting or concerning case orders and business schools. Uh, I have one overview of a question and then I will, I will probably take a couple of uh, questions more. These are shorter questions probably. Uh, <clears throat> you've had the benefit of looking at management education for the last several years, uh, a decade and a half uh, to be precise. Uh, benefit of looking at business schools uh, in various continents, in various countries, schools of varying sizes and nature. Uh, what is your view on the current management uh, education system? How is it evolving and what are the pointers for us to take note of? Um, I'd like, <clears throat> I think, I, th I think this, if I look at it from the perspective of the case method, I think the case method is really well suited and very strong in debate and discussion and challenge. And it's the perfect host environment for business schools to address questions around business, around business ethics and behavior, uh, around inclusion and diversity, uh, around uh, sustainability and the environment none of which are cut and dried. They all need to be examined and explored and mainstreamed uh, rather than, uh, rather than um, taking place in separate watertight compartments. So I think there's much room for business education to start exploring the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals um, which which lists and specifies areas of concern for the planet. Um, our biggest our biggest challenge as a species is uh, is the climate, and how we handle that. And business sh should and and must have a role in addressing those that huge challenge. So I would like um, business education to mainstream that kind of concern into all its um, courses and curriculum. Wonderful. That's a, that's a nice advice and expectation that business schools need to explore and mainstream some of these concerns uh, like sustainability, diversity and inclusiveness and, uh, and all other SDG uh, that we are talking about and grappling with. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that. The second question I have is, we noticed that the attention spans are an issue for the, for the students. What, according to you, can be done to encourage an average student to read up the cases? Um, well, I think online can help, actually, because one of the things that online does is it can free time that would otherwise be um, taken up by um, administrative things. You know, when you go into the classroom before you start teaching, you may be giving students information about deadlines or uh, plans for the rest of the semester or social events and so on. Um, if, if that can be done online, then those kind of administrative tasks being taken away from the case discussion uh, actually frees up more discussion time to explore the case. So I think that, that that's one way it, that, that actually the discussion time can grow online. Um, I think it's important after the online class to for, for the teacher to remain online, to simulate that kind of moment where you're packing up at the end of a face-to-face -face session and students come up and ask for some clarification or for some help. So I think remaining online after the close of the session is a good way for, uh, for teachers to keep that level of support and engagement with students going. Um, the other point is that in an online classroom, everyone's in the front row. So there, are, there is no kind of hierarchy where people can hide at the back or, or hope to avoid uh, the, the teacher's um, gaze and questions. 
everyone can be called upon uh, equally and everyone has equal status. And also online, what's rewarded is thoroughness and research rather than the kind of grandstanding dra dramatizing thing that some people thrive on in the face to face classroom where they can project uh, they can project an image of understanding uh, the problem and having a good solution when actually it's it's a veneer it's it's very thin online you can test that much more thoroughly so uh, i don't quite know where that leaves us to answer your, in answering your question about how to how to encourage students to read more thoroughly but it would definitely include it would definitely induce me to read more thoroughly than I did as an undergraduate if I knew that I was more likely to be asked and questioned and tested in class. Great. I think uh, you have answered uh, very well in terms of uh, an approach that you suggested. The online approach will free up your time from various other competing activities, number one. Number two, online democrat democratizes the opportunity of being uh, uh, being present there in the front row uh, and also the teacher can talk to anyone and question them so the, the opportunity is equal for all of them so so thank you very much but i think uh, online going forward will have a lot of impact in terms of uh, not just the teacher and the student but in terms of effectively using our time uh, for for reading of the cases in our uh, while we are doing something else in the dormitory or at your residence and then come prepared for the case uh, discussion in the classroom. So, so, so greatly that is uh, going to help. Uh, uh, the next question that is coming up is another one. Uh, I mean, this is a typical, uh, why I'm smiling is it's a typical uh, question that you would have faced many times. And we have also seen that while studying the cases from this side of the classroom. Every person has a different perception uh, on the situations that are given in the case study. Uh, how to know which one is correct? Well, that that is the question. That's why it works. Uh, uh, we have to embrace ambiguity and uh, and be comfortable with not knowing what the right answer is. There is no right answer. It's the process that's important. It's the struggle of trying to get to a right answer where the learning takes place not actually in finding and you're not marked on your answer being 100 percent right because even if the answer you arrive at is actually the answer that the company performed who's to say that they couldn't have found a better one so it's um it's it's the process that's important rather than uh, the answer and the and actually part of the process is there are many different opinions about what the right answer should be so how do those students arrive at a consensus which uh, which they are all comfortable in supporting um, and one of the skills that still astounds me uh, of a really good case teacher is the way in which they can encapsulate and I can tell so can <laughs> I can tell Sikander that you're a good case teacher because you are you are rev reviewing and uh, encapsulating my answers much more succinctly than I am in, in giving them. Uh, the, one of the strengths of a really good case teacher, and, and I, it, it's just marvellous to watch, is the way in which they can, having written some notes on the blackboard, the way in which they can take students through the discussion and review it and recap and bring out really strong learning points from it, regardless of what answers are given back by the students. And the final thing I'd say is that although we are all very diverse in, in what we think the right answer should be, actually, in terms of um, statistically, the spread of opinion is probably much more consistent than we imagine it is. Uh, we can't say who is going to express which opinion, but most opinions have been heard in the classroom before. Okay, fantastic. I think it is the process that is important and not the right answer or the wrong answer. The beauty lies in embracing the ambiguity, as you mentioned. Uh, that's an amazing way to a takeaway for the teachers uh, who are conducting these uh, case studies inside the classroom. So it depends and calls upon the ingenuity and the 
maturity of the teacher and uh, and then of course there is a way to understand how many more number of uh, similar opinions are emerging out of the conversation or the discussion in the classroom uh, that is one way of probably saying that it is towards the right direction also uh, also I should have, sorry I, I sorry to interrupt I, I forgot I should have mentioned um, the teaching note is really valuable here for teachers because um, cases, for those of you who don't know, come as the case, which is the scenario which is shared with students, and a teaching note which is directed to the teacher and is is um, only available to the teacher and very strongly protected to make it only available to the teacher. And that shares the author's own experience of teaching the case and typical re responses from students in their classrooms. So that's a really um, supportive document for teachers coming to a case for the first time. Great. So the teaching notes also help the teachers and only teachers are privy to that note and not the students. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Richard, the next question is uh, uh, from one of the participants, uh, how quality case studies can be monetized by the case writers? Monetization is uh, is difficult. It's possible. Um, some leading case writers uh, um, monetize their cases quite successfully. The majority of cases or case writers don't. But collectively, case collections can monetize um, and, and can, um, can generate a lot of income to support the case writing activity and the publishing activity. Um, so I think it's probably it's probably um, more applicable to uh, collections of cases rather than to individual cases. In most instances, but not all, um, the copyright in the case is held by the school at which the author is employed. So really, that's a, that's a question for the school. But I, a first step is to establish a case uh, publishing support team. It may be very small. But they will uh, they will help um, pull up the quality of the cases that are being written, and also uh, consolidate the marketing and distribution of those cases, which makes it more likely that the cases will be monetized. But um, it's not going to be it's not like being a best selling author or um, producing a Hollywood movie or anything like that. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, one question and after that I request the audience to raise their hands in case they have any question they can directly interact with uh, Mr. Richard, uh, but let me finish one last small question. Uh, Richard, how plagiarism is dealt with in the context of uh, writing cases or dealing with the cases? Now, do you mean plagiarism of p other people writing the cases? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very difficult question. Um, I think um, we have some technology which helps us uh, track plagiarism. Um, I don't want to say anything much more than that because I don't want to encourage people to circumvent it. But we have technological measures which allows us to to track the, the cases, and it's um, amazing how um, how effective that is. Yeah. So there's some technology. Um, sometimes we get uh, students often say that they have come across this case before and it reads very, um, very much like another case. Um, and the other issue, I think, is also students sharing because of because they believe that there is a right answer. They sometimes share answers to cases, um, which if, if I can take under plagiarism, it's a kind of form of plagiarism in a way. Um, they're what some uh, what some case teachers do is they ask they ask the students to critique um, the case and to critique the answer. So they'll give the right answer, um, but then they're asked to critique it and say what is wrong with the answer, um, and that makes them confront the issues even though they think they've got an easy answer from from uh, a, a web sharing um, platform. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for that. Now we have two hands uh, raised. Uh, we'll ask them to actually... Dr. Somin Mukherjee, can you please ask your question? We'll open the mic for you. Yes. Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for this valuable webinar and arranging by Ifi Group. Uh, I'm I'm regularly viewer of this uh, webinar. Uh, the case research is something different. Basically, I am not a field of management study, but I am a field of medicine. I I did my healthcare management, and I teach the healthcare management in presently in Kolkata. But my question is that. Being a layman, how I will bifurcate the research paper and case study? I mean, how I will explain to my student that this is a research paper and this is a case study? What is the difference? Well, I think I think um, there are. Th I'll I'll talk about three items. There is a research paper, and the intention of the research paper is to is to is for the author to tell as much as possible about how good a job they've done in researching. A, a particular topic and to and to share insight and information and knowledge in an okay. academic setting yes then there are two types of case there is a research case yes. which which we're not talking about today but where someone will write about the scenario and say that this scenario conforms to a particular theory and that the and that the people in the scenario behaved in this particular way and will come to a judgment about whether they were behaving effectively or productively or not and it will it will take it will walk you through the scenario from the beginning of the story to the end yes the teaching case which we've um, we're talking about today uh -huh. is like a story but with the ending kept secret so um it will it will walk you through the scenario to a point at which if we're going to call the protagonist the hero okay the point at which the hero comes to the cliff top and has to decide yeah. how to get how to go should should they go down into the valley and back up the next mountain or should oh. they try to jump across the ravine okay in the research case, in a yeah. research case, the the author will tell you what the what the hero did. In a teaching case, that's the point at which the case stops, and students oh. have to decide what they should do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Somen, for asking that question. We'll now call Guru Raja Kulkarni to ask. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening, sir. Thank you for. Uh, giving me a chance to at least uh, ask my question i have I've taken uh, i work in a non profit organization and trying to build my career in lnd space so i have taken up the membership of cipd i think they have given my first assignment uh, is on case study actually i have to uh, they have given a, a an example company uh, or a made up company and they have given a scenario and they have asked me to write a business report for 3000 words and it's been two weeks. I am only been panicking or where to start or how to crack this. I'm trying to reach all the faculty that I know that I'm connected with and all. But now I think I, I could reach out to Sudhakar, Professor Sudhakar or somebody from ICFI might guide me. But how should we uh, look at it? Because the scenario that they have given is on how to bring back workforce uh, after post-COVID. Uh, the case is more... Uh, you know, working towards that. So how to at least look at it and start decoding. And I need to produce this before uh, 30th of May. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of CIPD. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that. I, I it's, it's, it's outside of my expertise. Um, I don't know if Professor Sadakar can. Yeah, can um, I'll let me, let me tell uh, Mr. Kulkarni that uh, he can contact me subsequently and we'll give you some solution and we'll charge you for that. You yes. can pay us and thank us later. Yes, sir. Yeah. Definitely. Good. Good. You, you are actually asking us to deal with a real problem and yeah. uh, how to bring back uh, these employees, how, how to get talent back. Yeah. I think those are pertinent questions uh, around the world right now. And uh, so we need to have a deeper discussion and then come with some credible solutions which are going to be useful and which are monetizable. Yeah. This okay. the, the case you. is more evolving towards organizational performance, actually. Sure. Exactly. exactly. We'll discuss that at a deeper level. We'll I'll yes. connect you with a couple of other professors and we can deal with that, not an issue. Okay. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, 
there are so many hands that are, but I don't think we can take so many questions, but uh, let me, Dr. Dhananjay Datta, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Actually, I'm Dr. Dhananjay Datta from Ikfa University, Tripura. So uh, my question is that, like uh, we do uh, case method uh, teaching practice in the classroom. So uh, what should be standard uh, time for a case? Uh, uh, like uh, 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 we discuss case flat, then medium size case, then large case is there. And we give a case, uh, you know, before the class to the student. So uh, like uh, if there is any specific standard time can be fixed. Uh, for a case uh, method teaching in the classroom. First question. Then second is uh, like in our university, we have you know nine department like nursing, paramedical. Then uh, we have education. We have uh, physical education, yoga, uh, then law, uh, engineering. So in this regard, uh, actually we have established one case research center also. So like basic science we have. So uh, is it possible to develop case uh, in all disciplines? Um, length of case time, that's, uh, that's really how much time have you got? I would say not less than an hour, but uh, yes. I, I've seen many case sessions um, around 90 minutes. Um, uh, however, some teachers, uh, if, it's a, if it's a long case, then they may come back to it in the course of the the um, the semester or the term, um, they may visit it in revisit it in several uh, teaching sessions and discussion sessions, and they may use it, the same case across uh, several management disciplines. They may look at it in in one in one session with an eye to developing an understanding of strategy, in another one look at it with a marketing slant or finance and so on. It depends on the, it depends on the case and the uh, rich, richness of the case and how you can apply it. Um, as to other disciplines, then yes, definitely you can uh, you can write cases in in many disciplines. I think it helps if there's a management aspect in it. But we have um, you know we have many collections that look at um, civil governance. Um, the, and managing the uh, application of uh, local government or national government. We have collections that look at the distribution of uh, health care. Uh, we have cases that look at managing um, arts organisations. Uh, others that look at um, animal management and farming and um, health care for uh, vet veterinarians. Um, so really there's, there, there are Definitely, um, business and management leads and is the strongest um, of the disciplines re represented in the case method. But we're seeing increasing numbers of cases from um, others. Even in fashion, for example, we have uh, a prize winning case and some case collections that specialize in managing uh, the process of creating and distributing and um, exploiting fashion products. Thank you so much, sir, for, for giving me the detailed answer. Can we now request uh, Vijendra to quickly raise this uh, question? Vijendra. Good evening, sir. Yeah, my, my just one question to um, Mr. Richard is, like, can we have a case with uh, uh, hypothetical uh, things like, uh, it's not like a uh, real camp case study. Can we fudge the cases? Yes, I think I think uh, some, some cases are hypothetical or they're they're exploring anonymized situations from the author's own experience, which may be cover similar ground. Um, so it's possible. It is. It is possible, but they are not nearly as common as cases based on real life experience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vijendra, for that. Uh, I'll I'll now request uh, Professor Prasad to come back and uh, probably take a question. And then after that, I'll take permission from Richard to wrap it up and close. I think uh, there are a large number of questions, but I'll focus on one. They're running short of time. And I think this is a million dollar question. Uh, this is about how do you write in an engaging way for a case? Well, I'll direct you to our website, which is www.thecasecenter.org. And on our website, um, there are a number of free resources for uh, prospective case writers. 
So explore those pages and you'll see quite a, quite a number of resources that talk about approaches to writing engaging cases and how to structure your research to create an engaging case. Um, I think what I'd start with is um, some industries and companies are inherently more interesting to um, students than others. So look at our best-selling cases. Um, you know, automotives are very popular. Technology is popular. Uh, service industries and food. Find a protagonist who is engaging because that's how uh, students find their way into the scenario. That's whose eyes they'll be looking through. Um, and then think a lot about your opening paragraph, how to engage students right at the beginning. So the first paragraph is very important. Equally, the last paragraph is very important because that's where you deliver the challenge, outline the dilemma. Um, and, the ch and that is this, the challenge that you are setting the students in the discussion. Keep the language simple. I think, um, I think it's, um, it is itself um, a, a kind of irony that we want complexity in the discussion. So the discussion has to be very rich and, and full of complexity and ambiguity in order for students to come with many different opinions. But that complexity is within the discussion. The case itself should lay out the facts very straightforwardly and simply. So look at simple language as well. Those are my top tips, but um, you'll find more support on our website. Thank you, I think, for uh, providing those insights. And uh, there's nothing like beginning to do and taking those steps and repeating them. You've given us uh, sufficient information to begin. Oh, thank fantastic. you very much. I'll, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll hand it back to Professor Rao. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think one last question I'm stretching. Uh, we'll take from Ms. Manisha Pillai and then I'll summarize it. Yes, please go ahead. Manisha Pillai. Good evening, sir. Am oh. I audible? Yes, yes. You're audible right now. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Richard. It was a very fantastic session. And uh, we have learned a lot on case study method. So this is uh, one of the problem which I have seen when the teacher who is facilitating the case study, uh, when they lack the industrial exposure, uh, how can they overcome it while facilitating in the classroom? I think I, I think their first their first and strongest uh, resource is the teaching note. Really understand the teaching note, and that will help you to really understand the case. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Richard. Sir, uh, this the, we we are now uh, at close to nine p.m. That is uh, roughly one and a half hours, so or ninety minutes of this question we have completed. So we'd like to take your permission to close this. Uh, there are several questions, but some of them are repetitive. Some of them are understandable. Some of them you have answered in your opening presentation, and therefore. Uh, we can probably write to you subsequently and seek uh, some clarifications. Uh, if they have. I'll summarize and share it with you, sir. With your permission, we'll, we'll hear from you at the earliest. Of course. Uh, <clears throat> sir, I can't thank you enough for this uh, wonderful session that you have presented. A lot of insights and details about uh, the benefits of the cases for various stakeholders. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this, this session has given a lot of confidence and uh, it has uh, helped the participants from various uh, domains like business practice, academics, as well as students or research scholars. All of them are emboldened and they are probably uh, much more strong in their aspiration to participate in writing cases and dealing with the cases based on the conversation that we are having. So thank you very much for that. Just for the uh, for the brief uh, summary, I would like to highlight a uh, few bullet points that uh, we have learned and we can take away, apart from several takeaways, just three, four. Uh, case studies actually connect the real life learning to the real world application. And incidentally, ICFI Business School's motto is real life learning and real world application. And this wonderful method of learning called case studies is something which is helping the management world uh, greatly and, and i'm sure there is a great future although the form varies uh, technology has strengthened and helped the way we study and deal with the cases multimedia has definitely played a very important role as you have mentioned 
uh, innovations have taken place. Late Deva Pratim Purkhastha, our uh, dear friend at Ikfai Business School who passed away last year, on May 7th last year, we lost him. Uh, he invented or he was the first one to write cases using comic strip and uh, he was he was greatly helped by Sid Ghosh. I'm sure Sid is somewhere in the audience. Uh, he'll take note of this. We will definitely, definitely remember the contribution made by Deva Pratim. I'm sure uh, everyone at the case center in the UK also uh, share the same uh, concerns, same feelings about Deva Pratim's contribution. So the, the takeaway that you've mentioned here is the experts in the field, the craft professionals, from technology, multimedia, video making, and presentation, will have to uh, will have to understand the academic design and contribute a lot. Uh, so they have a leadership role to play. That's a very very important uh, takeaway uh, for us. The business cases. The third one is the business cases or the business schools or people who are writing cases will have to explore and mainstream some of the concerns that are plaguing the world. The real concerns for the planet are in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate change, in terms of ethics, in terms of diversity and inclusiveness, in terms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, so on and so forth. I think we need to mainstream these discussions through case studies and management institutions otherwise also have these uh, primordial role to, to talk about, explore, and take forward discussions on these topics. Plagiarism is a very important aspect and integrity of academics, academic freedom are intertwined into uh, expressing in terms of case studies and furthering the learning for management community. Therefore, plagiarism is something that uh, it is a very easily caught technology is available and therefore, uh, all those aspiring to write cases, all those who are in, in facilitating the case, case teaching, and also the students will have to understand that this is, not, this is not the best practice. This is not one of those practices that we should resort to. Uh, there's a clear cut difference between a research paper and a case study. A research paper talks about the kind of depth that one can go into describing how much research He's giving the information about the whole scenario. Whereas case study very clearly uh, does not give you the ending. And therefore that helps us move towards proposing a solution by studying the entire case study. That's fantastic. The other takeaway is that case studies are not just restricted to management education. Over the last hundred years or so, Harvard has dominated this case method in terms of origins, in terms of uh, writing cases and even practice. It originated as we read from various sources that it originated from teaching law. And subsequently it has gone into education of management, education of science and in various other streams. As you have mentioned now, cases in the area of fashion, cases in the area of healthcare, cases in the area of government, administration, non-governmental organizations, social impact, also in terms of military intelligence, case studies are very, very uh, highly used. Several consulting firms in India and abroad, they buy cases from the case center and various other sources, and they use those cases regularly for, uh, for sharpening their brains, for brainstorming and keeping the consulting arm extremely strong and bright. So there are several advantages of uh, uh, cases as it is very useful for even the consulting business uh, business side of uh, uh, the stakeholders, apart from the ones we have talked about in terms of academic institutions and students and teachers. All in all, uh, it is a fantastic uh, session, sir. As I said, this is a great contribution not just this session, but your own personal contribution to case method and advancing it in several countries, several business schools across the world. Uh, on behalf of ICFI Business School and the ICFI Group, we would like to thank you. And uh, um, we, will, we will miss you when you retire in the month of June, as you told me, uh, we, will, we will, will definitely miss you, but we will keep in touch with you 
and try to draw upon your expertise and the huge experience that you have accumulated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you that uh, Mr. Richard is retiring in June after a long stint of one and a half decades with the case center and his contribution is something which remains forever in the history of advancing the case method in the modern context of management world. Uh, he has been a very, very big supporter of cases coming from India and other countries. He looked for diversity and is encouraged. And uh, uh, as you know, late uh, Professor Deva Pratim Purkhasta uh, was a star author. Uh, he was the best selling case author in the world for sixth time in a row. And this year he's not there. So the award has gone to someone else. Uh, so, so our relationship between ICFI and uh, the case center, the relationship between the case center and, and, and the world of management schools is amazing. And we wholeheartedly thank you, sir, for your contribution. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for those very kind words and for the opportunity to join you today. I'd like to thank VC Reddy, uh, Professor Prasad, you Sadakar, and my old friend uh, GV Mutaritlan, uh, everyone at ICFE uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, it's just been such fun. Uh, and, and thanks to all the audience for such interesting and really provoking, thought provoking questions. It's, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank you, sir. And I want to also thank on my own behalf and on behalf of Professor Prasad, all the participants who have joined today in good numbers from around the world. Uh, your questions are really, really good, as Richard has mentioned just now. Uh, these questions encourage us to conduct these sessions every Friday. It is the fuel for us to come back next Friday. So we are all coming back next Friday, as usual, at 7.30 p.m. IST with yet another leader, we are going to talk to Dr. S.S. Mantha, the former chairperson of AICT, the National Regulator in India. He's going to talk about AI-powered Atmanirvarta, the self-reliance and development powered by artificial intelligence. He has some solutions. He has some propositions to make. Let's, let's stay tuned at 7.30 p.m. in India. And in UK, it is 3 p.m. Uh, on Friday, May 20th. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time, energy, and presence of mind to ask so many lively questions. See you next Friday. Till then, do take care and have a great time. Thank you all and good night.